showed you an image that I would guess most of you have not seen for real, a grindstone. And uh, that's still an image we can all identify with. And for you in the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to put your nose to the grindstone. <laughs> so here we go. First of all, uh, I really like this statement by Georgia O'Keeffe. Nothing is less real than realism. Details are confusing. It is only by selection, by elimination, by emphases that we get to the real meaning of things. And I'm going to try to illustrate that a little bit as we go along. Let me start with some very difficult problems that we're facing these days. Uh, and you've all heard them over and over again. Preserving ecosystems, strengthening the immune system, and so on. Innovation, markets, internet, global trade, sustainable human growth. There's one characteristic that is common to all of those. They all involve a lot of individuals, we usually call them agents to keep a kind of neutral background because they may be antibodies in the immune system, they may be species in an ecosystem, so we just call them agents. And the two key things are, not only do they interact, but they learn as they interact. So, in reality, these systems, they never settle down. So we're going to be talking about adaptive agents who compete and interact. And we're going to be talking about networks of these agents. Every one of the systems I was talking about before involves networks. And here it may be helpful to think of one of these everyday things that we hear about all the time. Think of an equities market or a stock market where there's buying and selling going on all the time. Key thing here is that the individuals, the agents, create that market. But there's also what we would call an aggregate effect in that market. We sometimes record this as the Dow Jones or something like that. And these two things <coughs> affect each other simultaneously. If I hear the Dow Jones is going up today, then I'm likely to decide, well, it's going up, but it won't tomorrow, so I'm going to sell. Or I can decide I will sell. And different agents will make different decisions based on what is happening to the whole system. So first of all, we have conditional interactions. If the market's going up, then I will do something. That kind of thing, from the point of view of a mathematician, makes this system non-additive. The whole really is more than the sum of the parts. Whoops, a little too fast. And as I say, the aggregate influences the individual and vice versa. So we're going to call this learning or change of strategy on the basis of experience. We'll call that adaptation. So agents learn on the basis of experience. And if you think about how a market evolves over time, all we have to do is look at this last couple of years. Or if we look at something like an ecosystem, time scales longer, but we see this tremendous diversity with new species appearing all the time. That's what we'd like to try to understand a bit better. And we call these things complex adaptive systems. So what are some typical agents? Well, we've got, if we're looking at the ecosystem, then we've got the organisms. If we're looking at an economy, then there are the firms. If we're looking at the immune system, they're called antibodies. If we're looking at market, it's the traders. Here's what makes these systems both interesting and difficult. First of all, there is no such thing in a tropical forest as the best organism. Forest has tremendous diversity. A single tree in a tropical forest can be a host to 10,000 different species of insects. 10,000. It's just incredible. How do they all coexist? 
Okay? Or in a tropical forest, you can walk several hundred feet. We're not used to this in the temperate zone. Several hundred feet before you see the same species of tree twice. Okay. That kind of diversity is something that we have to try to understand. And of course, all of us have been, as individuals have our own ideas, our own grindstones, and so on. OK, so in these systems, innovation is occurring all the time. And this gets back to Steve's theme. Why and how? And finally, in these systems, anticipation, what we think is going to happen tomorrow, impacts what we're going to do today. And that doesn't require consciousness. Even something as simple as your gut bacteria, E. coli, will swim up a sugar gradient because it's wired in that food will be at the end of a sugar gradient. So anticipation doesn't require consciousness. OK, why do we want to more, know more about these things? Well, mostly when we handle these systems, it's by trial and error. But if we knew more, we could do things in a more directed, more creative fashion. So we would have principled ways to discover vaccines. Now, we do a little bit of that already. We know how the flu virus is going to change from year to year. We can anticipate that a bit. And so we do a bit of design on those vaccines. But by and large, most of the vaccines you hear about have been discovered by trial and error not by an organized or principled process. Uh, locating the key species is a key element of sustainability. We have to find which species, if we pull them out, are like the keystone of the arch. The whole thing just tumbles in. Okay. Lever points, physical lever points. Well, we know a lot now, or at least many of us do a lot more than we wanted to know about derivatives. But derivatives are fiscal lever points. We just didn't know what they were going to do. Not many of you will have heard of this astronomer, Eddington. But Eddington was an observer, not a theoretician. He was the one that first tested Einstein's theory of relativity and showed that it helped. Notice, here's an experimentalist that say the contemplation in natural science of a wider domain than the actual leads to a far better understanding of the actual. Now, that says something then about imagination. I'm going to talk a little bit about theory. This is a very old New Yorker cartoon, which is one of my favorites. <laughs> Please, Miss Sweeney, may I ask where you're going with all this? <laughs> and most of us, most of the time, ask this about most of our courses. OK, how are we going to get at innovation? And I'm going to state something that uh, many people would not believe right off. And that is, most innovation comes from combining well-known, well-established building blocks in new ways. <clears throat> and here's an example. Take that thing that changed the 20th century, the internal combustion engine. Every part of it had been known for over 100 years. Every part, and some for 1,000 years or more. The trick was in combining these well-known building blocks in a new way. And here are the, I'm not going to spend time on these, but some of you have seen these way too many times, the building blocks in physics, where you start clear down at the level of the blocks, you work up to nucleons, atoms, molecules, and so on. Each of these was a matter of discovering the right building blocks to build the science at that level. Here's something that you've all seen at least once and don't spend much time on. But this made the complete transformation from the by God and by guess and trial and error of alchemy to what we now call chemistry. And here we have originally 92 building blocks from which we build all the chemical compounds we know of. 
Here's a much simpler set of building blocks. Building blocks for faces. Now, what I'm going to do is pick 10 different features on your face. Hairstyle, forehead shape, eyebrow shape, and so on. 10 features and 10 alternatives for each feature. And then there are two questions. How many building blocks do I have? And how many faces can I make from those building blocks? I got the answer to the second question, 10 billion. How many building blocks? 100. 100, right? 10 sacks of 10 blocks, that's 100. So 100 building blocks to make 10 billion faces. Claim, this is the reason that we are so good at distinguishing one human face from another, because we have the right building blocks. Now, if you want to test that, Unless you spent an awful lot of time at the zoo, try to recognize different chimpanzee faces. They're a lot like human faces, but they'll all look pretty much alike unless there's something very unusual. You don't have the right building blocks. So anytime you want to go into an area, my suggestion is first step, try to find the building blocks. Now, one thing by doing this, for instance, this particular face has eyebrow one, eye shape four, nose shape two, mouth shape three. If you've got the building blocks, you can represent complex geometrical objects by, whoops, hit the wrong one. <coughs> by a, a string. Hooray. <laughs> so, claim to understand innovation, the creative, even the creative process, you have to find the right building blocks for the question or the thing you're trying to invent. And here is a small piece of genetics. You've probably read in textbooks or heard over and over again that the thing that drives the creative process of evolution is mutation. It is not. Point mutations in your chromosome occur about 1 in 10 million times. Almost none of you are carrying mutations unless you got them from further back. <coughs> Crossover, the reason part of you comes from one parent and part of you comes from another, occurs in every individual, in every generation. So it's 10 million times more frequent. And look what it does. Here we've got these two strings. Let's see if I hit the right button this time. This is a string of 10 digits that represented that face. Here's the string of 10 digits that represented this face. And these were done legitimately in those building blocks. Now I do crossover. Crossover takes these two strings, these two chromosomes, and simply exchanges the front end. Very simple. But look what you get. Two completely new, entirely different features faces, and so on. That's the reason you look partly like one parent and partly like the other. And that's what we claim, or at least I claim, drives evolution. That's the main driver. Crossover, not mutation. Okay. Now, just a word along these same lines about language. This man, Phil Osa, wrote this in 1908. He was the first person, really, in the Western world, up until his point in time, Chinese poetry was considered to be childish. Too simple, none of the clever things that go on in Western poetry. Phil Osa <coughs> spent most of his life, he was at Harvard, showing that this was far from true, that in fact, from his point of view, Chinese poetry was much more subtle than Western poetry. One of his main points is that things <coughs> are only the terminal points. They're the cross sections 
cut through actions. Now, just as a quick aside, the classical Chinese character for east is the sun rising behind the tree. And so Philos's point was that when you look at Chinese poetry, you have to understand it from this point of view, that things are snapshots of actions. And the minute you start doing that, you get an entirely different interpretation. Now, here's something that's language-like, but pre-linguistic. And this has something to do, as I'll show you, with the notion of anticipation changing the course of a system. If you look at tribes and baboons, there are usually troops of 50 or more. And by experiment, we know that any baboon can identify the sound, the voice, if you like, of any other baboon in the troop. So what happens with these troops is you have the usual thing, an environmental context and social status. If you have a high-ranking member of the troop, they keep reinforcing their status by having this thing called a threat grunt. And if Steve was up here, I'd ask him to give it. <laughs> the way you respond so you don't get beat up is you scream. Okay? And that's the standard interaction. It goes on all the time, all the time. Now, in universities, we have counterparts in that, and they go on all the time, too. <laughs> the thing that's interesting is if you twist this around so that the lower-ranking female gives a threat grunt and the higher rank screams, this doesn't happen very often in universities, but every now and then, every member in that troop, even if they can't see what's going on, will suddenly gather around. Because this is something different that's going to change things in the troop if it goes on. And so they anticipate, because of this inverted order, that something really interesting is going to happen. OK, back to building blocks. The reason that human language is powerful is because it offers us a standard way of combining utterances to make meaningful sequences of utterances. And this is just like the faces. If I have just 12 utterances here, I can put them together in 60 ways that are meaningful. If I change that to 20 plus 20 plus 20, suddenly I've got 8,000 <coughs> triples that are meaningful. So again, what grammars do, this thing that we hated when we were in high school, is gives us standard ways of combining things to innovate, to describe situations that we haven't seen before. And that's the power. OK, when we look at these complex adaptive systems, we have two big problems. One, I'll call theory of mind. And this involves being able to describe what goes on in our central nervous system in a way that lets us talk about the fact that we have a kind of autonomy. We can run things in our head independently. And Steve showed this with his three bells, independently of what's going on. We, and we know this, you know, it's hard sometimes to shut down your mind when it's running through these paths. So the thing that you have to think of if you're ready to talk about mind is that it is not, as psychology believed in the middle of the 20th century, it is not a behaviorist phenomenon. You cannot understand mind by simply watching current behavior. It is not stimulus response. 
It is somehow this ability to run models of the world internally. We see this most easily when we try to play a game. But we do it all the time. So that's one big problem that theory, this one plus one equal two, should give us. Something that tells us what to look for there. The other thing that we see all the time, ecosystems, biological cells, human society, are these notions of boundaries and signals. If you think about language, we're talking about the tremendous number of dialects in the world and languages, and the ability to communicate within that group and usually not so easily between groups. Why do these come about? Why do they persist? Given the universality of television, why isn't there one great universal language? Well, it's a lot like ecosystems. There are niches, and these niches are filled with particular needs, particular kinds of interactions. So, quick review. These complex adaptive systems are always dynamic. There are always signals flowing, always resources flowing. They're always known. Boundaries are being formed and deleted all the time. And these are political boundaries, but they can be interaction boundaries, they can be the organelles in the cell, but they're changing all the time. And if we're going to understand these things at all, as in most things in this world, we have to find the repeatable features. And my claim is these are the building blocks. Theory, and there are lots of ways of talking about theory, but the main purpose of theory from my point of view is it tells you where to look, where to find the things. Theory is best constructed by using building blocks, and to find the building blocks, that's the big thing you hear all the time now, and part of the reason you hear it all the time is because of these complex adaptive systems, and that is cross-disciplinarity. Comparing across disciplines is a great help in finding building blocks. Something that may be obscure in one system, like an ecosystem, may be pretty obvious in a market system, and vice versa. So, main point, if you're going to do this stuff, you need to be cross-disciplinary. Thank you.